Hey everyone, welcome back to the Questing Behavior podcast, and today we've got another great episode for you. As always, my name is Mala, and I'm here with my much better half, Sarah Bowen. Hello, I'm here. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. And we're immediately going to dive into the interview, and I would like to introduce you to our guest, who is Saranj Sharma. Saranj, how are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Great to be here. Very happy to have you. And as always, as we do on this podcast, immediate first question, who are you, what do you do, and how did you get there? Sure, yeah. So uh, again, uh, my name is Saranj Sharma. I'm currently Behavioral Science Lead at Final Mile Consulting, which is a behavioral research and design company. And mm-hmm. uh, and we basically integrate behavioral science with human-centered design to try to solve complex problems. Uh, and we have historically, historically done this intersectorally. Uh, so we have worked on uh, consumer behaviors, financial behaviors, organizational behaviors. I uh, myself come from a public policy background. So within Final Mile, I have worked primarily on uh, uh, social sector uh, behaviors in the social sector and in public health. Uh, and more recently, Final Mile itself has sort of uh, decided to focus more on, on these particular sectors, the social sector, developmental sector, and, and public health and population health particularly. Uh, so that's what I've worked on as well. Uh, my, as I said, my background is in public policy and in management. And uh, you know, during my grad school, I, I studied behavioral science uh, and and sort of got more interested in that uh, in the application of this particular discipline in public policy, and I saw Final Mile doing some great work there, and and that's how I sort of uh, got here and worked at Final Mile. I've been here for like, uh, like seven eight years now, and have oh. worked on a number of issues uh, in India, in Africa, uh, as well as in other countries, including US. I'm currently based in US in Chicago, uh, but I moved here only last year till uh, uh, till then I was in Mumbai. Uh, I also uh, sort of am a content creator uh, mm-hmm. in behavioral sciences. Uh, I, I have a YouTube channel on educational uh, explainer videos on behavioral science concepts. It's called Go Nudge Yourself. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I try to be regular about it, but I release like videos once in like two months about uh, deep diving into uh, uh, topics on behavioral sciences, different biases, heuristics, and looking at uh, a slightly uh, different perspective towards these biases, not just looking at its application and implications towards decision making, uh, mm-hmm. but also trying to understand uh, the evolutionary underpinnings of these behaviors, the neurological uh, under, underpinnings of these tendencies, the mm-hmm. cognitive mechanisms that explore this, that has always sort of been very interesting to me, uh, mm-hmm. along with its application. And mm-hmm. uh, as I've been a practitioner for a long, long time, I also wanted to sort of get into that side and and, and look back at, at the discipline and, and engage with it in a deeper way. And sort of this, uh, the, the YouTube channel is an endeavor towards that, while I continue to sort of apply uh, behavioral sciences uh, in solving problems in, in my role uh, at Final Mile with the practitioner hat. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> one hell of an introduction. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested with all your experience at Final Mile uh, and you sort of applying behavioral science to public policy and all of these, you know, big challenges. Uh, what, what does it actually mean from, from your perspective or as you understand it? to apply behavioral science within public policy? Like, is, is it a process or a state of mind? How would you describe it to someone who you know, maybe doesn't, wouldn't know what the answer would be like me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, very much. I think, I think that's a very good question. I think uh, as you put it, applying behavioral science to public policy, is it a state of mind? To some extent, yes. Uh, because what we often see in public policy is uh, this distinction between policy makers and the beneficiaries of policies. And uh, I think what behavioral science, along with many other disciplines, does 
is that it tries to bridge the gap between these two, right? The, the designers of public policies and the beneficiaries of public policy. And in many cases, especially I think in the developing world in the global south, there is a historical context of exclusion of the beneficiaries or uh, the audience of public policy from policy making, right? And that continues even in sort of the post-colonial era, right? As, as we call it, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that that uh, gap remains and and what i think behavioral scientists can do is um, inform policymakers about the real uh, needs challenges context of the beneficiaries and and you know because policymakers envision policy to sort of unfold in a certain way and in in more cases uh, 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 we see that the end users and beneficiaries don't necessarily engage with public programs, public policy in the way that it is intended by policymakers. And behavioral mm -hmm. science has a big role to play there in terms of improving the ethic efficacy of uh, policies and programs by making it more uh, 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 informed about the need of the beneficiaries. And in, in that way, it is also sort of a state of mind, but it also, of course, is a process. And uh, when we look at public policy, uh, I think why behavioral science has been seen uh, favorably, because I mean, you know, psychological and sociological insights have existed and have informed public policy for a long time. Uh, right. But these, these traditional social sciences uh, did not have as uh, rigorous a criteria for evidence as behavioral science now does it has brought in tools with which you can be more certain of the actual impact of your policies and mm -hmm. and that's why i think it's seen favorably by policymakers as well because it is based in evidence it is something testable because behavior is something you can observe while mm -hmm. psychology is something you necessarily can't every time right and so mm -hmm. that behavioral twist to psychology has really made it more amenable to public policy use and so being grounded in evidence and being grounded in uh, field work and, and lived experiences of end users, I think those are very important aspects that we need to bring into public policy that behavioral science can provide. Mm, yeah, fair enough. It's a really interesting answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So I'm, I'm quite curious. So obviously behavioral science has gotten quite the track record in, in the West. It is also, as we know from most sciences, a predominantly weird uh, subject. So Western, yeah, yeah, that, you, you know, the abbreviation. Um, how has it been applying behavioral science in India? Because that is a different ball game with regards to how open maybe the the public policy sector is to behavioral science, but also as you are dealing with quite a few cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I, I would see this, the question of weird, non-weird in two ways, right? Firstly, I think when we look at drivers of behavior or uh, psychological factors that are informing behavior, right? I see an overwhelming commonality, which is underappreciated across mm -hmm. contexts, across cultures, right? How we evaluate options, how we make decisions, how we form beliefs, how, uh, those processes, those cognitive mechanisms are basically the same, right? Just like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it, does medicine need to be different in, in, in one country than other to some extent based on, you know, what, what kind of environment you live in and what kind of diseases are more prevalent. But mm -hmm. finally, you know, your body is the same. It's the same with brain. Overwhelmingly, you see that the hard wiring is is the same of, of emotions right affect these are hardwired things you don't mm -hmm. see a lot of variation in these what you see a lot of variation is of course in the cultural context right uh, so mm -hmm. uh, and social aspects play a big role in that uh, so how do you interact with your community uh, how do you form groups uh, how do beliefs spread within communities and then where do you land up, right? Because of those historical dynamics, what are the current beliefs that your community holds? Uh, and that differs, of course, across cultures. But I think at the base, behavioral science, I think, transcends that divide that 
I think we sometimes over index on the weird and non weird okay. one. Mm -hmm. uh, that that basis is, is the same, right? But there is having said that, there are mm -hmm. massive differences, of course, right? It's, uh, and that comes into play uh, more when you design for behavior change, when you are more solution oriented, when you're looking mm -hmm. at, at specific problems, because mm -hmm. these problems uh, cannot be generalized. Problems, uh, when we look at social problems, when we look at problems uh, out there in the society, they are very specific. They are very closely linked, coupled and tangled to, to their context. And you cannot solve problems without understanding that context. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we we have seen this sort of historical pattern of weird scientists designing mm -hmm. for non weird people. But it's the design aspect, mm -hmm. the solutioning aspect, which I think is problematic. But I think studying human decision making itself, I think mm -hmm. that that needs to I think we need to be aware of the cultural differences, but not over index on cultural differences, because that's one component that's informing mm -hmm. behavior culture but there mm -hmm. are a lot other factors which are mm -hmm. much closely hardwired right which are there for evolutionary reason for our entire species that mm -hmm. are there for developmental reasons like adolescent decision making for example in our entire species and i think that that sort of uh, i think both aspects need to be managed and balanced but especially i think when you if you're a practitioner, you uh, should not be working in the lab. You should be working in the field, uh, and you should be work. And if uh, if you if you if you are trying to solve problems in in India in Africa, then you should be working in India and Africa for field work. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to go back to your lab, analyze whatever data uh, in your lab. That's fine, but I think to understand the context, to try to change behavior, I think that is uh that is the most essential you, it, it's it's indispensable uh and often mm -hmm. i think we have seen the tendency in the field of directly taking things from the lab and just sort of you know piloting and doing rcts on the ground without that awareness mm -hmm. of the real needs and challenges of the people that you are actually designing those solutions for and that's a tendency i think that's coming from that weirdness to some extent Okay. Uh, to some extent, it's not even weird. I think even uh, academics in the global south are doing sometimes similar practices mm -hmm. of taking things directly from lab to the field. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's more uh, of a practitioner problem. Uh, while in academia, I think culture should be studied, but it should not be over indexed. Right, fair enough. Right. No, I think that's that's really interesting. And I think you know, you, you touched on this, you know, you need, we need to actually uh, tap into the needs of the, the people who are going to be the beneficiaries or in the worst case scenario will be made worse off by these interventions. You know, you, you sort of talked about that into sort of, you know, what does it mean to apply behavioral science within public policy? So, I mean, I'm into, I, I would really like to explore that dimension with you because I think it's, really necessary, but it doesn't sound like a, a an easy problem to necessarily solve. Um, but for you, how would you go about, I guess, trying to you know complete that necessary step of the behavioral science process or mindset? How do you become aware of the needs of uh, the people at the at the receiving end of behavioral interventions? Very much, very much. I think for me, uh, uh, during sort of my career till now, I think I've learned a lot from uh, the design community. We work very closely with designers uh, at Final Mile. I think 70% of Final Mile is designers. And so we are basically trying to integrate human-centered design with behavioral science. And so I think a lot of these principles of human centricity or the user centricity, the user orientedness or user focus comes from long-standing design practices. Right. So there are there are a lot of toolkits to to pick from in terms of how do you mm. get to understand your user better already existing in mm -hmm. these uh, other disciplines which have been doing this for years. And uh, I think behavioral science. Uh, 
uh, originated as a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, subject. And mm-hmm. it needs to continue to be that, right? And so there, there are a lot, for example, that we can learn from design research, where uh, before going to the drawing board with any assumptions, you go and talk to your end user or your or the beneficiary, and you have multiple tools, right? You you go through whether a day in their life, or or you do ethnographic observation, or you do focus group discussions, in depth interviews. You play games with them. You 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 let them become the data collectors, right? And and document their lives and send that data to you. But I think generating that user data mm-hmm. before you get to the drawing board is very important, which often does not happen. You know, we we pick up like for example, you want to drive vaccination rates. I, I'm gonna pick this thing up, this lottery that we have tried in a number of cases, and see if it works here. Uh, you know, or or you know, I'm just gonna put put a default in there. You know, that can work sometimes. Mm-hmm. That can mm-hmm. work to some extent. But I think if we are more user centric, if we are more data driven, if we are more understanding driven, uh, uh, in terms of user understanding, then firstly we can answer the question of what problem to solve for. Because often we are trying to solve a problem that the end user does not necessarily recognize. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give I'll give one of the most prominent examples mm-hmm. that I've come across. Uh, this comes from some work we have done on sanitation in India. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, right. So India has, uh, I'm sure you know, an open defecation problem, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of Indians, especially in the rural areas, the traditional practice has been that you go to your fields and defecate there. You know, you're you're providing. You're providing nourishment to your fields, and it's sure. a good way of getting done with your business. Now we are, of course, trying to change those behaviors because those are unsanitary be- behaviors. Those are leading to spread of diseases, mm-hmm. right? And and general unhygienic conditions, especially mm-hmm. when these uh, uh, behaviors are transplanted to urban areas when people migrate from rural to urban areas where you don't have open fields. So, you know, you're defecating in public spaces. That's a big problem yeah. in Indian cities. Uh, when we studied this, right, we would, uh, the, the Indian government uh, over the last decade or so has started building private toilets, started, started funding uh, construction of private toilets for individual households. So you don't have to put in money for a toilet construction at your home. The government will. And a lot of people got it constructed, got these toilets constructed, but it was observed that they were not using it. Oh. So now what is the excuse these people have? I mean, you, you have a toilet in your home. Why would you still be walking 10 minutes in the morning and defecating out in the open? Mm. <laughs> that That Good. is, you know, beyond understanding, right? Uh, that's beyond understanding if you do not understand the user context. And as soon as we started... Uh, talking to you know uh, people who were defecating in open or people who had toilets and still were not using it, uh, we realized that while we had been framing uh, toilet usage as a step up for them, mm-hmm. they really saw it as a major step down in terms of their experience uh, of defecation. Oh. Oh. And the, the reason, the reason being uh, that suddenly you got them from open air, fully ventilated, well lit place uh, uh, sure. <laughs> to this closed space without ventilation, without sufficient light, concentration of unhy- unhygienic conditions rather than it being, you know, you being able to self-select where you're going to do your business today. Uh, now you, it's all concentrated in this one place. And so sensorially, it was a worse experience for them coming from open defecation. They were like, where's my ventilation? Where's my light? Where is uh, my private space? Right. And that would not occur to us, right? That would not occur to us. That's Mm -hmm. their specific problem because of their habits. And we are trying to change their habits. If someone was to tell us to change our habits for whatever reasons, we would have similar concerns about it if, if some of our, our key concerns were not being met. 
right? And and so I think this user centricity is very important to understand firstly what is the problem that you're trying to solve because a lot of times you would think that it's like an incentive problem uh, and and you know maybe they don't have money to build the toilets so let's give them money to build the toilets let's build it for them uh maybe it's an awareness problem maybe they don't know about the risks of unhygienic conditions so let's do more risk communication right but that's not working so what is the but it's by talking to them uh by empathetically understanding their context without judging it Mm -hmm. that you can firstly uh, identify what are the problems that you're dealing with and then hope to solve them. And even that solving process should be a, a more equitous process, should be an inclusive process where uh, you are not prescribing uh, you know, behaviors and solutions to them, but you are rather trying to find solutions that work for them in uh, their daily lives, in their context. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think that you start uh, the starting point should not be certain assumptions, shouldn't be certain frameworks that you're trying to build, uh, that you're trying to bring from literature or lab to field, but it should be firstly problems that you identify on the field. And then you get the insights from the lab and the literature to try mm -hmm. to solve those problems. So I think that's the way that behavioral science itself can become a little more user centric uh, and a little less lab centric. Sure. So this is a really interesting case. Uh, I think I, I generally was quite surprised when you told me that the building of toilets itself wouldn't uh, work. <laughs> but then I, I guess we, we grew up with toilets. So, I mean, we were indoctrinated from early age that this was the way to go. Um, and I, I never really considered the alternative. So that this is, a, I suppose, a different frame and context for us. I find it really interesting to see these types of uh, cases or case studies, if you will, in which there is such a, a mismatch between what we what we think would be the, the right approach uh, and what is actually the experience from the uh, the user, uh, as you call them, have you had any other um, just any other experiences like this? Because it's always very interesting to see this mismatch. At least to me, it's very interesting to see this mismatch. I, I want to add to that last example. We did finally. We, we tried to get them. We did not drop the entire endeavor of not getting them to use toilets. We do yeah. want them to use toilets. We had to, of course, introduce ventilation, lighting, customization, yep. make it sort of more aligned to their daily routines so they don't have to, you know, often using public toilets, have to wait outside uh, uh, while they are getting late for work. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, just just to add to that, to, to give another example, I think very interesting uh, example, a bigger scale as well. Uh, we've worked quite a bit on uh, on uh, HIV prevention and control in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were we were looking at um, the propensity to test for your HIV status among uh, men in Kenya. And <laughs> And we were trying to understand why men who are involved in risky sexual behaviors who might be at risk of HIV infection uh, are, are not going and testing for their uh, HIV status regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, right. and, and so you can have multiple hypotheses, right? Uh, yeah. You can have a hypothesis that they are that they are not aware that they are at risk, right? Or mm -hmm. or they don't care about the risk. They think they can deal with it. So you have a multi. You have this set of hypotheses, and then you have to see which which is the problem that really exists on the field, and you have to try to solve. Uh, what we saw when we spoke to men is that we saw two categories. Uh, we saw this one category, which was uh, uh, as I said, they uh, they did not realize the amount of risk they were taking with their behaviors uh, and how okay. exposed they were to HIV infection, right? And mm -hmm. here it becomes an awareness problem and then bridging uh, the gap between awareness to intent, right? So a more uh, the sort of awareness and motivational approach could take care of this cohort. Mm -hmm. But this other cohort that we saw were very well, uh, very well aware of the risks uh, of HIV, mm -hmm. uh, what what kind of behaviors are putting them at risk, 
what can mm-hmm. they do to manage those risks like condom use and and avoiding uh, 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 multiple partners uh, or, or and and things like that right mm-hmm. uh, but uh, but they were still not going and testing uh, for their own HIV status and what we saw here was that they were almost convinced that if they were to take a test today, they would be probably HIV positive. Uh, so so they had already come. Ostrich, they just don't want to deal with the possibility of it. Okay, yeah, I see. Full on ostrich. As, yeah. Yeah. As long as they can avoid it, yeah. uh, they want to live in the bliss of ignorance. Yeah. And and mm. to sort of uh, protect themselves from the psychological uh, displeasure of, of having to deal with it, HIV positive yeah. status, they convinced themselves that they already are HIV positive. They just don't want to find out. So we saw this beautiful uh, inverted U curve, really, uh, mm-hmm. uh, of uh, your concern about your HIV status and your propensity to test. When you're very less concerned, you don't you don't test uh, for your HIV status. But if also you have very high levels of concerns that that then becomes stress Mm -hmm. and then you then you're more concerned with coping with stress instead of coping with hiv and Mm -hmm. and this is sort of in a way uh uh and and the reason for this one of the reasons for this was that people equated hiv being hiv positive to certain death and we realized we realized that this is basically a legacy issue of mm-hmm. the HIV awareness campaign back in the days, back in nineties and early two thousands, sure. when sure. there was no cure of HIV, uh, uh, when it was very hard to manage these cases. Now mm-hmm. we have a lot of drugs. We even have, uh, uh, vaccinations for HIV. Uh, but that information hasn't gone down to the ground, but the risk communication that we had done 10 years back, that everyone now knows and that's having unintended consequences 10 years down the line so that that was very interesting and this is what complex problems are right you solve a problem at one time but you know 10 years later it could arise in a very different form so i i find this such an interesting example and i'm curious to know like uh, what the result of this finding was finding that the, there was sort of two distinct groups of of people and sort of almost like two distinct problems that you needed to solve. What was it like to come up with uh, a sort of a solution? Were you able to find one that sort of worked for both, or or were you having to have a multi pronged approach in this case? Yeah, very much. I think, uh, and this now goes across problems that we solve, we have realized that one size fit all approaches just don't work when you're trying to actually move the needle on the ground. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to be really very precise of uh, not just what demographic segment you're looking at, but also what behavioral segment you're trying to solve a particular problem for. Because within a demography, there would be multiple cohorts with different problems, really. An example here being, you know, the people who don't have enough uh, perception of risk about HIV and a group that has too much risk perception about HIV. And both are mm-hmm. problems, right? And so you mm-hmm. have to solve for two completely different things. And and so uh, I think o- over years, what we have collaboratively with many other partners, uh, partnering organizations and researchers, uh, we have developed mixed methodologies to build behavioral segmentations. Uh, so, so we, uh, so that that's one of the outputs that we usually create. It's it's basically just uh, this uh, be, uh, segments of population based on what are their particular challenges, barriers, or behavioral problems, or drivers, or motivations, and and we classify mm-hmm. different uh, uh, kind of cohorts uh, of users and then have multi-pronged strategies and approach to sol- solving their problems. So for ex- if we take the example of HIV testing, you have to uh, address one cohort by building risk perception. And so you think of awareness campaigns and 
uh, trying to get them at their workplace, trying to get them at the place of their recreation activity, uh, and and providing an opportunity for them to learn more about HIV risks that they might be exposed to, mm -hmm. uh, right? And then and then create those links to testing uh, where they can go and test. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you take the testing unit, a mobile testing unit, to them, you know, right outside their football ground. So that young men come out, learn about HIV, and then they can immediately go get tested, right? So okay. this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of approach that would work for that cohort. For the other mm -hmm. cohort, uh, they uh, are completely ignorant of it, right? They are probably very stressed about it, very scared about it, and uh, sadly, they can't talk to anyone about it because it is such a stigmatized topic. Uh, yeah. HIV and and the stigma has come uh, counterintuitively from public awareness campaigns, which said this is a very dangerous yeah. disease, and that yeah. led to stigma ten years down the line, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And and now you can't talk to anyone about it. So we have to there we have to look at you know firstly uh, in any context where you're trying to uh, target them, you have to make sure of their privacy confidentiality. Uh, right, and and then provide expert counseling to to basically change that mental model from HIV equal to certain death to mm -hmm. HIV being a completely manageable condition today, right? And, and yeah. providing those examples, those uh, role models within your community of people who are living with HIV. Now, the the challenge there is that it's such a stigmatized topic that people who are successfully managing HIV in the community do not reveal that they are HIV positive. And mm -hmm. hence, you would not find out about people around you who are managing HIV just fine. But you will learn yeah. about people around you who are struggling with HIV, right? Because they can't hide their symptoms too much. They can't hide that they are going to uh, the doctor every week and every month. Right, mm -hmm. you can't hide a death. That, yeah, so that's the thing, right? So you have you see the negative examples of living with HIV, but positive examples try to maintain their privacy, and so you'd never learn about them. So you have to create mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. examples. You have to make them accessible to people so that they can see that a normal life with HIV is possible. Yeah, I'm I'm imagining soap soap operas and celebrities and things like that coming out with HIV. You're, you're just thinking way too much of the Christina Vigieri episode. You just want, you think every behavioral, scientific, social norm solution should be in soap opera form. That's just what you want now. <laughs> so there was actually, there was this uh, 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 TV series called MTV Sugar, which was really, really popular in Africa, I think early 2000s and 90s, which created a lot of HIV awareness. And it's one of the mm. uh, most successful uh, uh, case studies of, of uh, HIV awareness interventions. So yeah, that, that also does work, but awareness won't work for that second cohort, right? And that is what people, what that is what practitioners sometimes don't appreciate enough, that you might have good solutions, but they might be limited solutions. They might work for some populations to some extent. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So on, on that topic specifically, we, we always like to look a bit more towards the future just because we can. So how would you like behavioral science to develop in that aspect? Or who, how do you see behavioral science develop in general? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I think, uh, I think uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID, of course, has been, uh, I think, a, a almost a, a, I, I would imagine a watershed moment in behavioral sciences because till now it was a, a subject of interest. It was a, a cool topic, uh, right? A cool thing to work on. Uh, suddenly uh, being in the middle of pandemic, we realized that behavior change is often our first line of defense against some of the biggest problems that we might encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So uh, when when uh, the pandemic began last year, early last year, the biggest challenge for the global community was to get people to shelter in place, was to mm -hmm. get people to 
practice hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene and mm -hmm. wear masks and practice mm -hmm. social distancing. These are all behavioral problems. Today, mm -hmm. as we have finally sort of, we see a, a light at the end of the tunnel and we sort of see a solution on the horizon in the form of COVID vaccine, there mm -hmm. is still a behavioral problem of vaccine hesitancy that we need to overcome. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, this situation, this experience has created the right kind of uh, scrutiny and pressures and visibility of what is being done in behavioral sciences. And I hope that this will in future lead to more rigor, uh, more uh, and bring behavioral science out, out of labs and to the mm -hmm. field and right uh, to to people and and how we how we change behaviors at homes how we change behaviors at workplaces uh i and i think I, I think that's so i i would imagine uh behavioral science really expanding in ambit but also becoming sort of more focused and more rigorous in uh, its approach in methodology i think it will become more inclusive as well because earlier it was just behavioral scientists who were work working on behavior change issues with covid we saw absolutely everyone working on behavior change right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like your residential societies have to get people to change behaviors your local businesses have to make sure that people are wearing masks indoors mm -hmm. Right. Uh, governments are working on behavior change. Private sector is working on behavior change. Suddenly, everyone was working on these big behavioral problems of our times. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a great infusion of of different schools of thought and different uh, methodologies and approaches as well. That will, I think, in the long term, really benefit the field. So I, I see I see a really good future, a really promising future for behavioral science. But it has a long way to go. I would still say that it's a nascent uh, discipline uh there's uh, uh uh and it it has a long way to go in terms of becoming rigorous and mm -hmm. and applicable something that we can count on next time we are dealing with uh, a serious emergency situation we should have a playbook of how to change behaviors and shouldn't be scrambling to figure out how do how do we go about making people uh, behave the way they need to to protect themselves and protect others around them. Uh, mm -hmm. And and I, I think uh, uh, some of the debates that behavioral science has had about uh, the agency and uh, and freedom of the end user, I think, becomes very important. Right? How do you manage public health? Uh, uh, priorities with the freedom of people to wear or not wear masks how, how do you balance that and these ethical debates also have come to the fore uh, and and it'll be interesting to see where we go in terms of these ethical debates because these are at the basis of behavioral sciences uh, mm -hmm. and and I, I think yeah so we have really i think this field has learned uh, from a trial by fire in terms of dealing with COVID. And I think that's always a good thing. That's always a good thing. So I, I see a, a good future for behavioral science and a lot of uh, rapid changes in next decade or so. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Lots, lots of positives, but also lots of things we need to be continuing to strive and work towards. I mean, we here are a big fan of the democratization of behavioral science. Um, and yes, we'd love to see that too. So, I mean, the one of the last questions we get to ask you, and maybe it's the most important one, is, uh, is there anything you'd like to plug right now at the end of the podcast i know you've mentioned your youtube channel and we urge everyone listening to go over and check out the good work you're doing on there but if there's any way you'd like to direct the listener to uh, after listening to this podcast now is your chance <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, i i yeah definitely i think so my youtube channel uh, is called go nudge yourself i started it like just over a year back now and I really enjoy doing it. I just shot my latest video yesterday. It's so much fun to engage with, uh, you know, academic behavioral science literature 
uh, I get to read so many papers. Uh, so it's been really fun for me. Uh, uh, and I, I, uh, I, I'll talk maybe a little bit about why I, I uh, you, still- you know, I, I went this way. Uh, mm. So I, I sort of personally uh, wanted to engage a little more academically with behavioral sciences while I engage a lot with it uh, as a practitioner. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the sort of the conundrum for me was, should I, you know, go back to school uh, and, and you know, or, or do like a, you know, a, a, a PhD in behavioral sciences now, or should I, should I continue, uh, you know, practicing and applying behavioral science and try to look at a self-learning approach? And uh, I think go nudge yourself. Uh, while I decided to go with the latter one, of course, clearly I'm not doing a PhD right now, and I am engaging with literature in in this way of of creating mm-hmm. a, a creative content output from it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the bigger goal for me personally of of go nudge yourself is to create these uh, short term goals and commitments, because mm-hmm. you know if I if I don't have a supervisor and if I don't have deadlines, it's very hard for me to make sure that I am researching all the time mm-hmm. and so when i have to put out a video every month or every two months it keeps me on the task of of yeah. uh, you know continue to read continue to grow continue to learn and then create a create a short term output but my hope in the longer term is that i'll be able to take this research in directions in new directions which i find interesting and so i'll be able to do new research and and uh, and sort of over years be able to shape it like a personal phd and i think it's 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 an interesting experiment for me because uh, you know i i have a lot of friends uh, peers in academia and i do see a, a need for um, uh, you know uh, some some uh, changes and updates in in the structure of how academia runs how especially how academic research runs uh, mm-hmm. and, and building more uh, self-learning into it, uh, uh, building uh, more of these uh, mm, uh, hybrid models of online, offline, in-person, remote learning, uh, self-driven learning, lifelong, lifelong learning. These are questions. How do we how do we sort of integrate that with the current institutions and systems that we have? And, and th- this is my exploration in that for the audience. I would say, uh, you know, what I think someone interested in behavioral science can find in my videos is that you would uh, usually get a lot of discussion about uh, the implications of behavioral concepts in terms of uh, decision outcomes, in mm-hmm. terms of, you know, your health behaviors, your financial behaviors, your uh, work or social behaviors. Uh, but I really tr- I'm really interested in uh, the the science in the behavioral science right mm-hmm. uh, so going back to uh, the brain uh, how does behavior uh, uh, how is behavior related to activity in the brain uh, mm-hmm. evolutionary and developmental psychology right why do we okay. have this set of heuristics and biases uh, and and not another set right what why ha- have these uh, particular biases been selected, uh, the, the cognitive aspects of uh, how do we process information in the brain and, and which, which leads to these biases. So uh, while I do talk about the implications for decision making and our, our own behaviors and how we can use behavioral science, I also talk about these aspects, uh, more scientific aspects, which can you know, simulate your curiosity if, if you're interested in human nature. Uh, mm-hmm. And I find it very interesting as well. And, and I hope that, uh, you know, there, there are people uh, and I know there are people who would find this very interesting as well. So uh, oh, we, know, we know they exist. Trust me, I'm pretty yeah. sure our audience will be fully on, on board with this. <laughs> And uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think in general, with regards to, oh, I mean, both your work for Final Mile and, and your work with, with your YouTube channel, I mean, please do keep it up. Do do inform everyone of what it is, like, you know, what makes us tick, uh, how we tick, <laughs> and how we came to be as is, uh, to, to just simply target uh, the system that we are as people. But yeah, uh, Sanj, I think talking to you was absolutely great. I think you've you've 
went through some really, really interesting case studies. I, I always love to hear about the more practical implications. And uh, yeah, to our listeners, please go check out his work and his YouTube channel. Check out Final Mile Consulting as well, because they are a great consultancy. And Saranj, just thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, likewise. This was a great conversation. Thank you for having me here. Uh, Yeah, lovely talking to you. All right. So that was our conversation with Saranch. Saranch, thank you so much for coming on uh, the podcast. It was, I mean, for me, uh, I always enjoy hearing from people applying behavioral science in the field, particularly in public policy, and with the extra element of applying behavioral science in a developing country and and across different countries as well. Uh, Some really cool insights, I think, came out of our discussion. Uh, What stood out to you, Nella? I think in general, I just always like to hear of uh, about cases where you have one intuition and it's very clear what goal you have in mind, uh, like what the desired behavior is, and that, you know, there is the idea that obviously this is the desired behavior. Like, obviously, it should be nicer to have your own bathroom or your own toilet, if you will, rather than having to go out in a field, just stand there, do what you need to do, I suppose. And, and that that is just so obvious to us and then it just backfires because you completely and utterly understood other people's motivations i think that in and of itself is just a great learning experience or like a moment of uh just just like a self-check like you know check yourself check what your own motivations are and check if they Mm. even apply to others i think with the uh, the the case we discussed with regards to public defecation um yeah that is uh, not a result i saw coming but i suppose standing in a field is actually quite nice yeah i think I, it it definitely reminds us that there is this disconnect between people who create policy and people who live uh, or are directly affected by the policy change and also you know reminding ourselves that that Policymakers are not omnipotent uh, mm-hmm. and are very human and so are very much guided by their own biases and perceptions and experiences of how the world works. And that creates some really expensive problems, especially when trying to apply behavioral science. So, yeah, I, I really like and respect uh, Saranch's point and perspective about, you know, actually working with the people who are going to be affected by the policy change to really invest in trying to understand what the actual problem is, not the problem that we think we're trying to solve, what, you know, and and the problems that we create by trying to solve the problem, you know? Yeah. yeah, It's super interesting. And I mean, particularly, I really like that example. Well, liked, you know what I mean? The example about the, um, the case about HIV and how they were able to identify a sort of two types of mm-hmm. people who weren't conforming or weren't going to get tested. And, you know, of course, there are going to be multifaceted reasons why people do or don't do certain behaviors. But mm-hmm. then once you know that there are these two groups, how on earth do you design a policy that works for both? Well, you don't. You design multiple policy inventions, but yeah. really cool to hear about it. I think it's a really tract- tractable example. Yeah, absolutely. I think this this would actually suffice as a as a really good case study of behavioral science in the wild, or behavioral science applied, or however you want to call it, or just more of the practicing side, uh, or the policy side rather. I think another really interesting point that he mentioned, which you know, given that we're both two white Western Europeans, is a is not super helpful for the diversity of this argument but we talk to a lot of people about weird to the western educated industrialized rich democratic subset and especially the the strong focus that we see on these types of countries in behavioral science because a lot of behavioral science is conducted in the west or at least is very actively promoted in the west if you rather phrase it that way and that sir Einstein comes forth just saying that he thinks, you know, weird as an issue specifically might actually be a bit over-indexed to the extent where, sure, there is a complete hegemony going on in the world, if I'm even pronouncing that correctly, 
Mm-hmm. But this might not extend into our research or into how we design certain studies as much as we think. And then you can blame it on weird, but you can also just blame it on the fact that the researcher did not sufficiently understand their target group. Mm. And then it suddenly no longer becomes a cultural issue, then it becomes an issue of that researcher should have done more research. And then it's actually quite easy to see where this went wrong. Well, guys, as always, we hope you really enjoyed this episode. We hope it was educational, thought-provoking, or at least entertaining. Uh, it's, it's one way to pass an hour of your day, I suppose. As always, everything we discuss will be linked down below, so you can reach out to Saranj, both to see him as a person, to check out his work, and to check out his YouTube channel, which I think is a, is a great initiative of a, you know, and a great way of teaching people more about applied behavioral science. And uh, yeah, we hope you have a great week, and we hope to see you again next week. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying You're the one I love, you're the one I wanna give